That was Smith Westerns with All Die Young right here on Free Association. And joining us right now is Congressman Dan Boren, Democrat's 2nd Congressional District in Oklahoma. So more than likely, he's your congressman. And we've got him right now on 91.3 FM. Welcome to the show, Congressman. Glad to be on. Well, it's an honor to have this moment with you right now. And one thing that I'd like to open up with is what's on everybody's mind. What's with this government shutdown? Well, uh, you know, obviously uh, the election, uh, the last election we went through, people talked quite a bit about spending. Uh, the fact that we have a $14 trillion national debt, that we're adding $1.65 trillion uh, every year on top of that. And uh, so Republicans just took the House, and one of the bills that they came out with would cut about $61 billion in spending. Uh, there was some back and forth about where the spending cut should be. And uh, if we do not pass a, a continuing resolution by the end, uh, around March the 4th, uh, the government will shut down. I believe uh, that uh, cooler heads are prevailing here. Democrats and Republicans will work something out. We're, you're going to have some cuts. We're going to have some spending cuts, uh, absolutely, but we're going to do it um, in a bipartisan way and uh, keep the government going at least uh, for a few weeks until we have a broader agreement. So it's not going to be 1995 all over again? I don't think so. And, you know, 1995 was a short government shutdown. Uh, you know, if you're shut down for a week, hey, maybe the parks closed down, a few things happen. Uh, but you start going into a month, we're talking <laughs> about seniors not getting Social Security checks, veterans not getting benefits. You have real problems after after uh, a few weeks. So I think both parties realize it's not in their best interest to shut down the federal government. Well, one area that the Republicans want to get after with the scissors is public broadcasting. Why are they wanting to cut public broadcasting? Well, I mean, I think philosophically for many years, uh, the Republican Party in general has been against funding, and not every Republican, there's some who do support it, uh, public broadcasting or maybe the National Endowment for the Arts or something like that. And, you know, uh, what I would say, the, the Republican bill that came out uh, eliminated funding for a lot of these programs or cut them way back. I think what would be uh, better, and you can actually cut more dollars, is for everyone to take a cut, whether it's public broadcasting, which is something that I support, um, or it's, uh, you know, ag subsidies or whatever the issue is, we all can tighten our belts. You know, it might be 5%, maybe 10%. Congress has already voted to cut its budget by 5%. Uh, instead of completely eliminating a program that is vital, uh, you know, as an example, the arts uh, in rural communities, uh, hey, is it absolutely necessary that we have it for survival? Probably not. But does it does it have a role in shaping people's lives and giving opportunities uh, that otherwise uh, folks from our district would not have an opportunity? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're, it's where we set the priorities. And, uh, you know, uh, I think right now with spending, the easiest way we can work this out is all of us need to share in the sacrifice, not just one group. Right. And public broadcasting is dear to my heart because that's one of the first jobs I had in the media was working master control at RSU Public Television. So I kind of have a vested interest in it. We, we've been on television with Dan uh, Scheidel. He's a great guy. Mm -hmm. He's, uh, uh, we've been on Perspectives. On with the, Sam Jones. Yeah, yeah. Sam Jones. And, you know, hey, uh, it's, not, it's not ESPN, it's not ABC <laughs> or CBS uh, as far as the number of viewers, um, but, you know, it's an educational um, programming. You're not, it's a different type of, uh, of environment. And, uh, 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 well, it's very, I think it's a, a boon for green country to have because you can oh, yeah. have uh, lo local elections, debates, televised mm -hmm. and that that really is an asset for green country now you're a you're the top democrat on 
the subcommittee for Indian Affairs. Could you elaborate on your responsibilities? Well, um, the Indian Affairs subcommittee has jurisdiction over uh, a lot of different issues. Indian health care, um, gaming obviously is an issue, but uh, you know everything in Indian country that you can think of that touches tribes. And in our district, uh, particularly, we have the highest Native American population in the country per capita. And, uh, you know, there's so many, uh, you know, programs that, that affect Native Americans, whether it's housing programs, uh, you name it. And being uh, the top Democrat on that committee, I think, will help our state. And, uh, you know, um, it's, it's, it's going to be interesting. It's the, this subcommittee is a newly formed subcommittee. We only have a small number of members on it so that we can give it the, the um, attention that it deserves. Uh, I'm also on the Intelligence Committee, uh, which has jurisdiction over the CIA, the FBI, the NSA. And I've taken a leave of absence from the Armed Services Committee while I'm on the Intelligence Committee. Uh, a lot of the same issues intersect with those right. two committees. But, uh, uh, you know, Native American Affairs... Uh, you know, and the resources committee as a whole, energy, uh, we, we do a lot of uh, public lands issues, and then on top of that, national security issues on my other committees are, are, are I think, a really nice fit. Now, maybe this question would be more appropriate for a political analyst, but this is part of your district. Mm -hmm. With the Republican sweeps that happened in southeastern Oklahoma, would you say that Little Dixie is dead? For Democrats? Um, I, I Not necessarily. I think, um, you know, uh, eastern Oklahoma, our congressional district, has been the last part of the state that has remained Democratic, uh, in registration at least. It's been voting Republican for president for a long time. But at the local level, whether it's the sheriff, the county officials, and even the state legislators have been mainly Democrats. Uh, you know, and that still remains true, even though there were some Republican successes in the last election. Uh, a lot of it has to do with turnout and who came to this election. Uh, the Republican turnout was very high. Um, Democrats, for the most part, uh, at least you know, your, your base of the Democratic Party was pretty demoralized um, for different reasons. Uh, you know, when you have a lot of success, Democrats had a lot of success in Oklahoma and the country in 06 and 08, mm -hmm. um, there was almost like, why do I even need to show up in 2010? So I think 2012, I'm not predicting Barack Obama is going to win our district. I think he will be defeated uh, by a wide margin. But I think other Democrats that are on the ticket that are, you know, that, that represent Oklahoma, that are more moderate, that, um, you know, are fiscally conservative, I think they still have a role in, in Oklahoma politics. I think it would be bad for Oklahoma to become a one-party state. I would say that if it, if it was all Democratic. Uh, you know, parties in power in D.C. swing back and forth. And it's very important that we have someone at the table Let's say, as an example, Democrats have been in control for quite a while now in D.C. Uh, you know, it was very good that we had a Democrat from Oklahoma who actually got to be in those meetings where, you know, energy issues or whatever were decided. I mean, there were some things that I literally blocked uh, that um, could have done harm to the state. And the only reason why I was able to do that was because I was a Democrat. And, you know, I would even argue with... You know, with folks to say, hey, Republicans should support me because, you know, we have to have a counterbalance in the state. Right. You need to have the party in power and then you need to have the loyal opposition as well. You can't just have a, uh, a monolith in politics. The, the, what term is this for you? How many? This is my fourth term. Uh, this is my seventh year in Congress. Before I was in Congress, I was in the state legislature for two years. Okay. So So this is your fourth term fourth in Congress. Term. Mm -hmm. What one issue would you like to, if you could pick one issue that you could solve this mm -hmm. term, what would it be? The economy. Uh, you know, we've got a really tough situation right now. We have a 9% unemployment rate across the nation. You know, we're, we're a lot worse off than we were uh, when all this started. I mean, you look at the record deficits, the record debt. 
on top of you know, high oil prices, people paying more at the pump, people with all the new legislation that was passed, a lot of companies are scared right now. They don't know what the future holds. So if we can provide some certainty in the government and some certainty in the economy, hopefully we can get this turned around. Because if you have a job, you can provide health care for your family. You can provide mm-hmm. you know, food. And we can talk about all these other issues. But if we don't have a strong economy, uh, uh, we're going to be in a, in a tough situation. Right. Congressman Dan Boren, congressman of the people, by the people, and for the people. So with that said, let's get to Sarazino with people on 91.3.